The devil wants to do everything he can to distort why you were created and the giftings that God has placed in you. But can I tell you, God's intent for your life was for you to produce good fruit for good to come out of you, for you to do a good work. You were created to do good things. You were created with a purpose. The two most important things in your life is the moment that you were born and the moment you get the revelation on why you were born. He made you for this moment. You may be stuck in a situation right now. You may have an identity or a perspective of yourself that is so off base, but I'm telling you, God's not looking at you saying, you better get your act together or I can't use you. He says, just answer my call and I'll take you from glory to glory. We're going to work some things out. I know you got some problems. I know you got some dysfunctions. I know you got some issues, but I'm willing to walk on this journey with you. Come on, somebody say level up. We are starting a brand new series entitled Level Up the weekend after the Power Conference, and uh, I'm excited about it. You know, the Bible instructs us, we're, we're called to move from glory to glory to glory. We're not supposed to be stagnant. Come on, somebody. And, uh, you know, many times in our life, in our relationship with the Lord, we plateau or we get stagnant, but I believe that God's calling us to another level. How many of you guys want to go to another level in God? Amen. Well, hey, open up your Bibles as we as we conclude our series, Back to Basics. Have you guys been in, enjoying the Back to Basics series? We talked about back to prayer, right? We got to get back to prayer as a people. Uh, Pastor Paul Goulet came and talked to, talked to us about getting back to the harvest. And you know, the, the thing is this, a lot of us want the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but we have to remember the outpouring of the Holy Spirit wasn't so that we could have goosebumps. And so that we can have a great harvest, amen? God is all about souls. And uh, then last week I spoke on back to the prophetic. How many of you guys prophesied this week? Come on, show me, show me your hands. How many of you guys spoke under divine inspiration this week? And you say, well, pastor, I didn't shake, rattle, roll. My eyes didn't go in the back of my head. I don't know if I prophesied. How many of you guys spoke the word of the Lord over your spouse this week? Come on, you prophesied, right? Awesome. Well, hey, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter two, verse 38 as we conclude our series, and I'm excited about what God is doing. Hey, everybody say this Wednesday. As you're turning there, say this Wednesday. Wednesday. Try it again, this Wednesday. Wednesday. You know, uh, throughout this pandemic, it's been, it's been a little crazy. And uh, we've, had, uh, we've had so many people throughout our 415 churches, of course, as a church, um, worldwide, we've had hundreds of people uh, get COVID-19. And unfortunately, in some places that there's not the proper protocol to get through uh, COVID-19. And God gave us a wonderful gift through a man named Dr. Remedius that helped many of our people. Actually, I'd say almost all of our people get through um, COVID-19 with certain protocols. And it was the grace of God. And what happened is we asked him if he would come. He's a, he's a pastor in Louisiana, but he's also a medical doctor. And we asked if he would come and preach. And uh, he, one thing that he spoke to me on, he says, you know, one thing I'm realizing, I'm not coming to preach on the vaccination. I'm not coming to preach on any kind of thing. I'm going to come and we're going to break off the spirit of fear and the spirit of death. Come on, how many of you guys? And, um, you know, we've been, hearing, we've been hearing such crazy stories of people that, are not suicidal in any way, but they, they get COVID-19 and it does something with their spirit, it does something with their head. We've had people, I mean, have weird thoughts to take their life in the middle of this thing. Life's not even worth living. That is a, that's a demonic attack straight from the pit of hell. And there's a, a attach, and I'm convinced of this, attached to this COVID-19 um, demon <laughs> is, is a spirit of fear and a spirit of death. And, and so Dr. Media told me, he says, I'm going to come Wednesday. I'm going to preach your people. And we're going to break off that spirit of fear and that spirit of death. And uh, it's going to be powerful. Amen. So invite some friends. And, and like I said, he's not here to, to kind of tell you to take certain things or do certain things or not do or do that. He's coming to break off fear and break off death. And it's going to be powerful. We're going to have revival Wednesday night. Can I tell you? It's going to be amazing. All right. You guys ready? Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your word be a lamp upon our feet and a light upon our path. God, that you would do a wonderful work in our hearts. Lord, that you would strengthen us, encourage us. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place this morning. Lord, we need to be changed. Lord, we need to be encouraged. So let your word, Lord, speak to us in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. As we conclude this series, Back to Basics, the title of my message this morning is Back to New. Everybody say, Back to New. Can I tell you, it's not God's desire to refurbish you, it's God's desire to make you completely and totally new. You know, he says there's this man, he's, he's, he's hanging out with this man named Nicodemus. And he says something so weird. He says, Jesus tells this man, he says, you must be born again. If you want to enter into the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. And in that moment, you think, what in the world? Can you imagine being Nicodemus and be like, be born what? How, how can a man be born twice? But what Jesus was trying to do was to give us a picture of what his desire is, what God's intent for our life is, is to completely make us new. Totally new. It's not a refurbishing. Anybody here have to refurbish something, but there's still some residue of the old? God says, my desire is not that your life have residue of the old. I want to make you completely and totally new. I want to give you a new mind. I want to give you a new heart. I want to give you a new spirit. And can I tell you something? That's what salvation does. It's more than just a prayer we pray. It is a transformation of everything that we are. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, oh, I love this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Everybody say that with me. The old is what? Gone, the new has come. This is what God's desire for your life is. And this morning, as we look at what Peter is saying here in the day of Pentecost, this is again, we're talking about it being the first sermon of the, of the New Testament. Here it was, the first sermon of the book of Acts. And what does Peter say? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this morning, I just wanna give you these three keys. What does it mean to be made new? How do we go back to new. Well, number one, are you ready for this? Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Now, you guys know how we do here in this church. We've got a lot of scripture, so I, I should be hearing those, those pages turn, and there's no football game worth watching right now anyways. Not right now. Later on, later on, later on. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Are you there? Let's read this together. Therefore, brethren, having boldness or confidence to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So I want us to look at, go back to verse 19, and I want you to see this. Everybody keep on. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have what? Confidence. Since we have confidence, that's God's intent for your life, is to have confidence with him. Not to walk in shame, not to walk in fear, but when you approach God, to be in such a way, in such a manner where you are washed, completely made new, that it now develops a confidence. There's no residue of the past. Any, anybody here, my, my wife, I love her, God bless her. She's sitting in the front row and now she's looking at me crazy. But her, her and her mom, her mom comes uh, over to Oahu occasionally, and um, her and her mom, they, they decided to get the discounted laundry detergent. And uh, so she washes my clothes, and I thank God, thank, baby, I love you. You're amazing. But I, I put on my clothes, and I, I smelt yesterday. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody here, you put on a shirt and you're like, why do I still smell yesterday? 
Like, what's going on? And I'm walking around, and it's like I still got residue. Now, can I tell you what happened in my interaction with people is the residue of yesterday impacted my relationships of today. That's why I do thank God for masks. I, I will say, some of you are like, Pastor, you believe in COVID? No, I just wear my mask because my breath is howna right now. Just, and you know, I just thank God. You know what I mean? But when you understand what Christ has done, the old is gone, the new has come. Wow. He deals with every part of our life, the residue of the past, everything that hinders or impacts our confidence to be in his presence. He makes you new. He makes you clean. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to walk in condemnation any longer. Well, what's imperative for us to understand is how do we access this confidence? It's a new and living way. It's a new and living way. It's the blood of Jesus. Pastor, that seems very morbid. No, you have to realize that the blood of Jesus was the price that needed to be paid. The blood of Jesus, a, ma a sinless man, a man that would come God in the flesh, dwelling among us, would go to the cross and pay the highest price so that you could be forgiven. And his blood, his blood was the price for the penalty of our sin, our death. It was upon him. So we have to realize that now Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the solution to our pain and our hurts and our shame. He heals us. And it says this, I love this passage. Look, look at verse 20. Go back to verse 20. And I want you to see this because it says, by a new and living way opened for us through what? The curtain. This is a direct parallel. Just keep that up there. This is a direct parallel of what Christ did on the cross. See, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil that separated man from God was torn in two. Now that means, see, back in those days, the only person that could go beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies was the high priest. But when Jesus, the great high priest, came and he died on a cross for our sins, he made available to us the power and the presence of God. Now this is what I love about it. Jesus, in his death, that veil was torn and it was a sign to say, I love this, what does the writer of Hebrews say? That he opened up for us a way through the curtain. Who's the curtain? Jesus now became the curtain. That's why he would have the audacity to say that I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes through the Father, to the Father, except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. Me, Jesus is the way. Someone needs to hear this this morning. Jesus is the way. Pastor, why is that so important? Because you have to realize that the way to a new life in Christ is him. It's not just the law. See, the, the law... The law was made obsolete. We see in the book of Hebrews, I believe it's in Hebrews chapter 8. Why was the law obsolete? It was because... Our nature. It wasn't that the law wasn't good. The biggest problem with the law was you. And our natural tendency to sin. But see, the issue with the law is the law was incomplete because the law could point out sin and the law could direct, but the law couldn't save. I'm going to say that again. The law was incapable of saving you. Only Christ could save us. He is the way. It is through Jesus. Friends, there is, I've heard people say, well, pastor, there's a lot of ways to heaven. No, there's only one way. No, there may be a lot of ways and a, little, a lot of avenues to Jesus that we go through in life, but there's only one way to God. There's only one way to heaven, and that is Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something? Buddha didn't die for your sins. 
Confucius didn't die for your sins. Jesus died and was resurrected. He is the way. And so now he gave to us a new and living way. Well, pastor, why is that so powerful? Because there's no possible way in all your goodness, in all of your self-righteousness, that you could be good enough to earn salvation, that you could be good enough to earn healing. But through Christ, it becomes attainable to you because of what he did. Isn't that amazing? I mean, think about this. I, have, you, have you ever tried to accomplish something great, but you couldn't do it because it was way beyond you? Christ did what you were incapable of doing so that you could take hold of it. Salvation is yours. And I'm about to say something. Probably going to make a few people upset at me. I love you. Look at that person next to you say, I promise, pastor loves me. God, that was weak. <laughs> Some of you are like questioning, I'm like, I don't know about this. What's he getting me into? I, I, 21 years, 21 years of full-time ministry. Did you know I've never, ever been criticized for preaching Jesus? except for today. In this environment, in this atmosphere, pastors are actually being criticized in preaching Jesus. Pastor, why aren't you preaching on the coronavirus? Pastor, why aren't you preaching on the vaccination? Because that's not my job. Listen to me, listen to me. I'm about to say something. I'm gonna, I know we may lose some people after today, but the last time I checked, my job as a pastor is to preach Jesus. Now listen, and him crucified, and him resurrected, and him living in you, and him being the source of your salvation. Yeah. Pastor, why are you saying? Because this is the truth. The Bible says it is appointed to man one day to die. And then, judgment. <laughs> So my goal, my objective as your pastor is to point you to Jesus and it's so sad what we're dealing with today. Everybody wants to know everything else except for Jesus. What does Jesus have to say? What does Jesus have to do with this? How is Jesus moving? I don't care what the news is saying. Can I... Sorry, I gotta hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Breathe, count to 10. I, can, I, can I tell you what's frustrating is that the problem, the epidemic within the church is people aren't trying to find Jesus. They're not looking for Jesus, they're looking for something else. But yet here we are trying to give people Jesus. When, can, we, can you imagine we could get back to that position of the church where they said, give me Jesus or give me death. I don't care, I just want Jesus. I just want, I just want Jesus. Pastor, it's all about Jesus. When I come to church, what am I gonna hear about? Jesus. We gotta get back to that. Never thought that the church would ever be criticized for not, for, for preaching Jesus. Friends, that needs to become your desire. I want to hear Jesus. Why? Because he is the way in your life. Direct your life to Jesus. He is your path. He's, <laughs> he's your aim. He's your goal. I say new way. It's so crazy how Peter, this is amazing to me. Peter gets up to preach. Peter substantiates Christ and the reality of Christ as the promised Messiah. And he says, I want you to see this, his works, his word. Jesus, Jesus proved himself to be the promised Messiah by that which he, he spoke, that which he did. There's no question whether or not Jesus was the promised Messiah. And then he even goes on to continue to substantiate the reality of Christ by, by pointing to the witnesses of his death. Oh, trust me, he was crucified. Dan Brown, I think his name is Dan Brown. What is his name? 
Is it Dan Brown, that weird author? <clears throat> Jesus died. You know how I know Jesus died? It's not that he faked his death and then went off and married somebody. You know how I know Jesus died? Because Romans were experts at killing people. And they wouldn't let you off the cross until you were dead. You, you understand that? So there were witnesses that actually saw Jesus die. They knew, they were convinced. There was no doubt he was dead and he was buried. But there were also witnesses of his resurrection. And I love, I love Peter, he gets up, he says, in this congregation today, thousands of people, in this congregation today, there are people that saw him die. That was me. They give witness, they gave testimony to Jesus' death, but there are people here today that gave testimony to Jesus' resurrection. They walked with him, they talked with him. See, Peter substantiates the reality of who Christ is. Can I encourage you, church? Instead of spending so much time arguing about the vaccination in your conversations, can I just say this? I don't think the vaccination or the coronavirus has enough credence to litter your conversations. Can you imagine if we became witnesses? Like, let's, let's get back. I mean, I think about, you know how many conversations I've walked into that I, I've just kind of gotten to the point where I'm just tired. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired. I just walk up and be like, hey guys, how you? Oh, we're talking about the coronavirus. I'm like, I'm seeing you later. I just don't, I don't even want to have anything to do with it. Why? Because I just want to be, I want to be, I want to be a witness of Christ. Like, can you imagine if the church, instead of, instead of the church becoming so enamored with the vaccination or the virus, they became enamored with Jesus again? We could actually use this moment as one of the greatest revivals and one of the greatest tools to see people saved. Well, pastor, people have to know what's going on. They have to know what happened. Listen, all you need to know is Jesus. Why? Because can I tell you, a vaccination cannot get you to heaven. Just letting you know, I'm not against it. I'm just saying a vaccination can't take you to heaven, but Jesus can. Can you imagine if the church just got it back together and went back to Jesus? Can you imagine what could happen even in this season? Let's get back to Jesus. So man, what do you think about that? I think Jesus is real. Let me tell you how Jesus healed me. Let me tell you how Jesus saved me. Why not? People need hope right now. People need Jesus. All right, I think I belabored the point. If I say new way, when everybody say new way. But the second thing that, Paul, that Peter begins to preach is he says a new identity. He says something very unique. He says, be baptized. He says, repent and be baptized in the name of Christ. Now, there's a conflict, and let me just deal with this theologically very quickly. There's a conflict. There are many people that, um, there's a movement called Jesus Only, and we thank God for people that love Jesus. We all need to love Jesus. But the conflict stands where Jesus Only says, uh, Jesus Only uh, people that are oneness movement believe that, hey, this scripture substantiates the fact that we just need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And if you were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you weren't really baptized. So that's what they'll say. Oh, you were baptized into a cult, bro. But the problem, the conflict is Jesus and the Great Commission tells us to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what exactly happens here? When did the theology change from what Jesus said to now what Peter's saying? Well, what Peter's dealing with specifically is he's dealing with identity. Peter's dealing with identity. See, baptism, water baptism is an identity issue. Now, look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Everybody turn with me to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives inside of me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I, what? I live unto the Son of God, who loved me. Now, now this is amazing. 
What we understand is we identify, when we become water baptized, we identify with Christ's death and resurrection. My old man is dead. I'm now dead to this world. I'm dead to my sin. Come on, somebody. I'm dead to my flesh. I'm dead to my lust. I'm dead to my anger. And now I'm resurrected in Christ. I have a new life. The old is gone. The new has come. There we go. But what's unique is this. So John the Baptist, and many of you have heard me explain this, John the Baptist does something crazy. Now, we already know he was nuts because he ate locusts. I mean, we already know, crazy dude. But John the Baptist is in the desert, and he's preaching. He's preaching to Jews to be baptized. Now, this is a problem, is that baptism in those days were reserved only for Gentiles or non-Jews, to become a Jew. If somebody wanted to become a Jew, they had to number one, get circumcised, like that's not enough. (laughs) Can you imagine going, I want to become a Jew. Good, get circumcised. Never mind. (laughs) Maybe that's not for me. They had to get circumcised, first of all, but then the second thing is they had to be baptized in water. So now you can understand the conflict that arose where John the Baptist gets up to prepare the way for Jesus and starts telling Jews, not non-Jews, telling Jews that they need to be baptized. Like we're already Jews. He says, no, 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 there's a new identity for you. Just as a non-Jew or a Gentile identifies with being a Jew by getting water baptized, we're gonna identify with the coming Christ. So now Jesus, Jesus dies and he rose from the dead and Peter gets up and he says every single one, the audience that Peter was talking to are Jews and so now this conflict he says hey all of you need to get baptized why because baptism is a sign of identity you're saying now I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm not, I'm not surrendered simply to my religious affiliation. I belong to Jesus. I am new in him. We have a new identity. Friends, you are not what you used to be. When you become a, when you become a Christian, It's more, like I said, it's more than just a salvation prayer and then we say, hey, I can be in heaven for all eternity. You gotta understand this in your heart of hearts. Please hear me. You're made new. You have a brand. I know people spoke crazy stuff over you. I know people did crazy things to you. I know some people, they had an address that was not their real address for a long time. If you know what I'm talking about. Pastor, you know how many years I spent in prison? You know how many years I spent in this? You know how many years? That no longer defines who you are. (laughs) Pastor, I was taken advantage of. Pastor, I was abused. Listen, friend, I grieve. Friends, I grieve with those who have had to feel the pain of abuse. I grieve. I had a teacher tell me. She... She says, uh, you have a learning disability. Can I tell you, that was the greatest thing that I could have ever heard. Because when I didn't do my homework, I was like, I have a learning disability. <laughs> Just saying, I use it. If you, go, if you go and get it, work it. You know what I'm saying? It's like. <laughs> but until we can learn to identify who we are with who Christ is will never fully take hold of everything he has for us until we can shift to identify with everything he is will never take hold of everything he has for us friends salvation is about an identity shift you're new Your past no longer defines you. Oh yeah, but people, pastor, people remember. People remember. That, friends, people will always remember. I still, I still have people in our church on Maui that call me goober. If you call me goober, I will work you. Just saying, I'm just saying, just letting you know. I will pray for you. People 
people are like, where'd the word goober come from? None of your business. Just leave it alone. <laughs> but I have to have confidence in who Christ sees me to be. I have to have confidence in the fact that I'm accepted by Jesus. I'm accepted by Jesus. The last thing, if I say a new way, if I say a new identity, but let me give you this last one. You ready for this? A new reality. And Peter says to repent. That word repent, its original language means to change one's mind. To change one's mind. Well, you say, well, pastor, that's, that's a little difficult. Well, let, let me just kind of help you understand. How, how, do, we, how do we change our mind? We, we've got to get, number one, we've got to get a different view of sin. We've got to see the reality of sin for what it truly is. You know, I, um, I don't like chihuahuas. I'm just saying, you know, don't look at me like that. Some of you are like, well, pastor, it's a, it's a small little dog. They're... Those things are ferocious. Can anybody know? Anybody here own a chihuahua? Okay, we've got three people. See? You see? You see what I'm saying? So I'm in a friend's house, and this, this little chihuahua bites my ankle. It's like literally bit my ankle. That's why I call them ankle biters. They, it bit my ankle! And I'm freaking out. And my friend's like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, this dog doesn't normally do this. I'm like, yeah, right. Right. So this thing bites my ankle. Now every time I see a chihuahua, I'm like, get away, get away, just, just stay over there. I don't care. I don't get that thing on a leash. I'd rather play with a Doberman pincher than a chihuahua. Why? Because my experience with that chihuahua now impacted my view. It changed my perspective. See, unless you see something for what it is, until you can actually view sin for what it truly is, which that, it is that which brings forth death. If you don't see sin as sin, you'll keep flirting with it. Oh, pastor, it's not that big of a deal. Eh. See, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is what? Death. death. The wages of sin is death. So we have to change our mind concerning sin. Until you can actually change your mind concerning that sin, you'll never properly change your mind toward Christ. I'll tell you why. Because your relationship with sin will always impact your relationship with Jesus. It's because it's not just a physical death, it's a death within your heart, it's a death within your soul, your spirit. So you have to change your perspective of sin. That equals death. But this is the thing I've seen, and we've, I've said this many of times, you guys have heard me say this many of times. You can change your view of sin, but until you get a proper perspective of Christ, all you're doing, all you're doing is stop doing one thing. And that's good, I'm glad, man, I'm glad people have found themselves out of alcoholism and drug abuse and all these different addictions. I praise God for that. But at the same time, you can stop doing bad, but if you don't turn to Jesus, because it's not, you gotta realize something, it's not the difference between good and bad, it's life and death. So we actually have to turn from sin and to Jesus. That was the issue of the book of Hebrews, and one of the reasons they wrote the book of Hebrews is because people were saying, well, you know what, we're gonna turn away from our sin, but we're just gonna go to the law. But the law can't save you. You gotta to turn to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. So Peter makes it clear. He says, look, you gotta repent. You gotta acknowledge sin and you gotta to turn to Jesus. He's our savior. But this is crazy. Listen to this parallel. Turn, put, put up there Ezekiel chapter 36. I want you guys to see this. This is awesome. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. I will sprinkle, see if you guys can see. We're talking about baptism. We're talking about salvation, repentance. See if you can see the parallel. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. 
I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Next verse. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. See, this is exactly what Christ wants to do in us. This is amazing to me, that that parallel, exactly what Peter says, look, repent, be baptized, and God is gonna do a work in your life. See, if we're talking about the third thing, which is a new reality, we got a new way, which is Jesus. We got a new identity in Christ, but now there's a, a, a new what? Reality that you can live in. Many of us have been victims of our current reality. Pastor, how do I, how do I transition from one reality to the next? Ezekiel tells us as a foreshadowing of Christ who would come and do the work. Number one, we have to have a new mind. Now, can I just deal with something real quick? We're gonna close here in a few minutes. We need a new mind. And I think one of the dysfunctions, if you, don't, if you guys don't mind me just jumping on this, is when you, when you first step into a place of trying to break from having one addiction, you're like, in this time, I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best to lose weight. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like, oh, Jesus. So I can stop wearing black. I actually want to wear colors. <laughs> I've been fantasizing wearing pink. You know, just joking. <laughs> but <laughs> um, to, to break my addiction, what I do is I, I change, I transfer my addiction. So I go from being addicted to ice cream to now, don't laugh at me. <laughs> I, go from, I, be, I go from being addicted to ice cream to now being addicted to carrots. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Just like, I, I just transfer my addiction. See, a lot of people, what happens is, even, even with the, the, the mind of an addict, what happens is, I'm addicted to drugs. Well, now I'm addicted to Jesus, right? The problem is, you still have the mindset or the dysfunction of an addict. Now watch this. Your mind has been, you've transferred, but you haven't transformed. Now hear me, hear me, please, please. This is important. Because a lot of times, with, especially within the body of Christ, we settle for a transfer versus going to the next level, with it, which is a transformation. We transition or we transfer addiction. Well, pastor, I, never, I don't do drugs anymore. Well, maybe now you're addicted to working out. Well, that's not bad. That's not a bad thing. No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not demeaning the transition. But are you truly transformed? Romans chapter 12. Do not conform any longer to the patterns, the patterns, the patterns. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now listen to this. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm building this as a foundation for what I'm about to say. Is if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. I'm almost done, I promise. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Now, the reason why I'm concerned about the transfer instead of the transformation is because a lot of times we settle. Pastor, I'm not addicted to bad things anymore. But do you truly have the mind of Christ? Is your mind truly changed? Is the pattern of your mind truly changed? Is your thought life truly different? Have you allowed Jesus Christ to completely and totally transform your mind? Pastor, how is that even possible? Let me give you one more scripture. Are you ready? Romans chapter 8, verse 6. So now the wonderful privilege that we have is we actually have the mind of Christ. He gives us a brand new mind. Romans chapter eight, verse six. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. So 
So what the real issue is and what, what the word of God is helping us with is this. Friends, it's, it's not just a thought issue, it's a government issue. What governs your mind? What, what have you determined as that which governs the choices you make, the places you arrive to? What governs your mind? Does fear govern your mind? Does hate and anger govern your mind? Does the past, can I ask you, does, does the past govern your mind? You know what I believe? And, and, and this is hard. Can I be honest with you? This is hard. I, I'm, I'm the preacher for crying out loud. But this is the reality of what Christ wants us to step into is that when we have his mind, guess what? Now, as I decide, I'm going to change the governing factor of my mind. So instead of my mind being governed by the past, being governed by my hurt and my pain or having other people and their opinions govern the way I think, I'm going to allow the word of God to become the governing factor of my mind. I'm, I'm going to actually, now, now this is the hard part. I know that a lot of us, we want to get the word of God through osmosis. Right? I'm serious. But the problem is this, that you can't actually allow, I'm working really hard on trying to, Mike, get a shot of this. Michael, hurry, quickly, hurry up. I'm losing balance, bro. I know a lot of us, we want the word of God to govern our mind, but in order for the word of God to govern your mind, you gotta get it in your mind. Pastor, why do you always push us to read the Bible? I don't wanna read the Bible. Because it governs your mind. It changes your perspective. That's why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the greatest influencer you can get. That's why we need to spend time in prayer. Can I tell you, my time in prayer with the Lord is one of the greatest moments where the governing of my mind shifts is in prayer. So we gotta pray. We gotta read the Bible. We gotta be choosy. We gotta be selective on what we allow into our mind. So what are you saying, pastor? It's not enough to simply refocus your mind. You need to regovern it. Did you hear what I just said? It's not enough to simply refocus. Oh, focus, focus, Morocco. <laughs> it's not enough to simply refocus our mind. We need to regovern our mind. But how do we step in, pastor? How do we step in the new reality? We have a new mind. Secondly, we have a new heart. The, the Hebrew word here for the, the word heart in, in, in the book of Ezekiel is actually the word lev. It's spelled L-A-B, but it's pronounced lev. And what's so unique about that is it shows the perspective of the seedbed. This is what it means. That word lev in Hebrew actually means that it's the seedbed of our will and our emotions. So when, when it says that I will give you a new heart, it means that I will give you a new filter. A new way of experiencing things. I will give you a new, I'll give you a new way to process how you feel. That's crazy because I'm very emotional. As you can tell, I'm an emotional eater. I do, and I feel good all the time. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm Italian. I'm emotional, man. I'm cray-cray. I'm serious. I'm like, I'm passionate. I, I scream, I holler. I, as you can tell, I do the moonwalk. I dance. I do all that kind of stuff. If I didn't hurt myself, I'd do the Roger Rabbit. I'd do the... But I might embarrass you. Anyways. I got emotional problems. Anybody here, I don't want to be the only person, anybody here battle with your emotions? Because the, the biggest problem is our emotions actually become the filter of our reality. And so because we're so prone to listen and obey that which we 
feel and experience. And the problem is we process it through the limitations of our own heart and our own emotions. And some of them, some of them have already been processes that we've developed year after year after year to feel a certain way about certain things, about certain people. That it's very difficult that when we're going through something to not allow, it's hard when we're going through something to not allow our emotions to now become the factor in which determines our reality. So pastor, how do I do this? We've got to get a new heart. Pastor, how do I get, pastor, how do I get a new heart? How does this, how does this even work? Can you imagine, just by some stretch of the imagination, I want you to just imagine this for a moment. That every experience that you ever had in the past that told you you have to operate like this, in one moment shifted because of a revelation. You see, emotions are tied to revelations. I want you to get that. Your emotions are actually tied to revelations. A revelation on who somebody is, a revelation on a certain <clears throat> nationality, a revelation on a certain feeling or a certain experience. And so now your emotions are attached to that revelation, but if your revelation changes, if your revelation can change of who you are, if your revelation can change of what you're facing and what is actually in front of you, it actually changes how you process what you're going through. I want you to think about that for a moment. See, I believe that what needs to happen is we can get a brand new revelation. Did you know you can get a brand new revelation concerning your spouse? You can get a brand new revelation concerning the coronavirus. If you get a brand new revelation on how you feel, and who you are. See, what my son, my 10-year-old son, when he was growing up, he got a specific revelation. Someone in school told him that he was a certain thing. So now he would process everything through that revelation, and then in that, he would act out a certain way. So now my wife and I, guess what we're doing? We're giving a new revelation. And in the process of getting a new revelation, now he acts out differently. He responds differently. Why? Because your feelings are attached to your revelation. And if you can get a new revelation of who you are in Christ, if you can get a new revelation of the situation you're facing, if you can get a new revelation of your finances, if you can get a new revelation of your body, if you can get a new revelation of your marriage, it will begin to shift how you handle the things and the situations that come your way. So he gives us a new mind. He gives us a new heart. And you ready for this one? He gives us a new spirit. As I close, Minister Milo, come to the piano, please. I've literally got two minutes to close this service. You guys think I can do it? Start praying in tongues right now. Come pray in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I'm so limited. Can I be honest with you? I'm so crazy limited. Like the limitations of my mind and the limitations of my emotions hold me captive all the time. And this is the biggest problem. I, I'm just talking about me. I'm not talking about you. I'm just talking about me. Okay. I, I am, I am, I am a victim of my own limitations. I think all of us, we're all kind of bound to the limitations of our flesh, our natural understanding, our, our way of thinking and processing. But you know what's so amazing? Is that when we have the Holy Spirit, that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us, it quickens our mortal body. So can I tell you why that's so powerful? It's because it takes you to a place that goes beyond <laughs> the limitations of your mind and the limitations of your spirit and taps in to the spirit of God who is unlimited. That can actually supersede 
the limitations of my understanding so that when I'm bound, I'm held captive to thinking a certain way and living a certain way and responding a certain way. I have this source that I can go to for strength. I have a source that I can go to for perspective. And I have a source that's living inside of me that can help me produce fruits of the Spirit. I mean, think about how profound that is. That no longer do I have to be bound by the limitations of my life, but I can walk in the supernatural. I can actually respond beyond my limitation. That means I can live a supernatural life. Think about that. God has given you a gift called his spirit so that you can live a supernatural life. You know, there, there's times where I, maybe some of you can relate. I was going through a situation <laughs> and everything in me, I just wanted to lash out. Wanted to freak out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Everybody ever have a freak out moment? I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. I, see... <laughs> I think we, we've all had those freak out moments. And it was the other day, I was, I was straight up, <clears throat> Don't ask my wife about it. Just, I was straight up having a freak out moment. And all of a sudden I, I recognized it. I said, Holy Spirit, I need you right now. I, that was actually my cry. Holy Spirit, I need you right now. Help me, help me, help me, Holy Spirit. And you know what was profound? Is that right in that moment, there came inside of me an unction. He didn't possess me. <laughs> but within me came an unction that I can respond differently. Within me came a power and a strength to respond differently. And the peace of God that passes all understanding began to guard my heart. Begin to guard my heart one moment but I had to determine in my heart to go to a different source in your thinking in your feeling in your living there's a new reality in Christ you can go to a different source ask every one of you just to close your eyes just for a moment and I'm real, real briefly going to pray for you and I know <laughs> I know there's some intensity in this word this morning but I believe God wants you to step into the new he wants you to step into the new there's a new living way there's a new identity that God has for you there is a new reality that he's given you if you say, Pastor, I want that for my life. I'm not here. I'm not going to put the microphone in front of your face. I, I have no desire to embarrass you. But just by a show of hands, if you're saying, Pastor, I, I want to step into the new. Some of these things that you're talking about, Pastor, I, I, I acknowledge in my life, I need a shift. In my life, I need breakthrough. Pastor, will you pray for me? On the count of three, I want you to lift your hands. Ready? One, two, three. All over this house. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being real. I want everybody to stand your feet. Come on all over this house and let's just worship the Lord.
I want to have a, a new reality, Pastor. I want to have a new heart. If that's you, we're going to pray right now. I want you to just lift your hands to the Lord all over this house. I want you to pray this with me. Jesus. Jesus, wash me. Purify my mind. Give me a new heart. Put a new spirit within me. Jesus, you came to give me life and life more abundantly. You came to give me a new reality. So Lord, do a new work in me. Jesus, I believe that you died for me, that you paid the price and the penalty for my sin. I believe you are the risen Lord and I surrender my life to you in Jesus' name. Now, if you believe he's doing a new thing in you, will you just give him some praise all over this place?